This is a guy that goes to the places where they have the drive-by shootings that you hear about in the mainstream media, where angels would fear to tread. Jesse Lee Peterson is an angel on assignment by God. He is a wonderful Christian man. He grew up hating white people. His family worked as slaves on a farm in the Deep South, and he went back and he lived there. And then he moved out to L.A., and he found that some of us white folks are okay. And he had a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of purpose in life, and I would like you to give him a real great big welcome to Sacramento, my friend, the Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson. Wow, thank you. I appreciate that. I am, I've been on, when Juan had his radio show, I was on there so much, I was thinking about taking over the show. <laughs> He's really been a good friend. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I absolutely appreciate it. I, uh, I want to start out by saying that I am not, one thing I want to clear up, I am not an African-American. I don't have an Afro. <laughs> I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. <laughs> there, there are no African drums beating in my chest. The American guitar is playing in my heart. I'm as black as the ace of spades. You turn these lights out, you won't see me. <laughs> you just see white teeth. But 100% American. And I love my country. I have to love my country. I thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you about what we're doing uh, uh, in a quick way here because I only have a little time, 30 minutes at best. I also want to tell you about courage and how you have to be courage. You can, uh, courageous. You cannot uh, be afraid. You can't have fear. I grew up on a plantation down in Alabama, uh, right outside of Montgomery, Alabama. My parents and their parents and their parents worked the plantation. And uh, I remember the Jim Crow laws, and, and there were places that we were not allowed to go to because we were black. Um, I remember going to a movie theater once, and black Americans had to sit in the balcony. I was a teenager at the time. We were not allowed to sit downstairs with white Americans. We had to sit in the balconies. And I was OK with that as a teenager because we had a better view on the balcony, right? <laughs> so I was okay with that. And I have to honestly tell you, I can't remember one time when my grandparents or my parents told us that we should hate white Americans. They said that if you do the right thing, you treat people the way you would like to be treated, then you can make it. Just don't be mean, don't be angry. And so I did not grow up that way. I left home, though, at the age of 18. I moved to Los Angeles. And at the time, I had a lot of doubt and fear and emptiness within me. I had like a void, and I didn't know where that void or that emptiness were coming from. And so I started to go to some of the churches in Los Angeles around town there because I thought if I went to church, I could get help. I can understand how to overcome my doubt and my fears. Uh, I went to the churches, and I would talk to the black preachers about what I was going through. You know, I would say, you know, I have this emptiness. Uh, I don't really feel like a man. I can't really stand up to life in the way I should. And they would say, well, it's not you. It's racism. It's the white man trying to keep you down. And so after a while, I start to believe that. I believe that lie. And, and then I start listening to Louis Farrakhan and Jesse Jackson and other people. And they, too, were saying that it's racism. You know, it's not you. I remember going to one of Louis Farrakhan's meeting in Los Angeles, and he, was, he said that white people were the blue-eyed devil and, and that the Jews were the blood-sucking Jews. And um, later on, he said that the way that the white people became the blue-eyed devil, the way that white people came about, is that black people were the first people on earth, and they, we were smart, we were it. And then some black men turned evil and went into a laboratory and created the white man. And, that, 
And that's how we ended up with the blue-eyed devil. <laughs> and I bet you, you didn't know where you came from, right? <laughs> but because I had, I had become angry at white Americans, I believed into that lie. I believe that. Isn't that amazing? Because when you're angry, you cannot see the truth. You can only believe a lie. When you, and, and whomever caused you to become angry, they also control you. They can get you to do whatever they want you to do, whenever they want to, because they control you. They made you angry. And so I believed that for a long time. And long story short, I started to question, because the Bible said that, you know, know thyself. And so I started to question things. If white people are holding us back, how is it that Jesse Jackson and the NAACP and others, they're doing very well. They're living in great neighborhoods. <laughs> They're living in great neighborhoods, you know, their kids are going to the best schools, they have the best jobs. And, uh, and I'm thinking, well, if the white man is holding us back, how come they're not holding them back, you know? <laughs> the best thing that you can do for yourself is start thinking for yourself. A lot of folks do not think for themselves. It's amazing how that is. And up until that point, I was not thinking for myself. Then, long story short, I asked God to, you know, God, let me see myself. You know, I don't know how to overcome myself. I don't know how to deal with women. I don't know how to deal with life. To let me see myself. And so one day I'm driving down the road, and I heard a Jewish preacher who believes in Christ. He said that if you, when you pray, be still and know the truth. Just go into your prayer closet. You don't have to be whipping and whining and begging God for anything. He already know your needs, your needs. And prior to that, I have been begging God whenever I would pray. You know, I would beg God, oh, God, bless my mama, bless my daddy. Give me some money. Uh, <laughs> I want a house. You ever done that? <laughs> All vain stuff, right? Because God said when we love him, he would take care of us. We don't have, really have to be begging for those things. And I would ask God for a wife. And every woman that he gave me, I could not handle her. So I stopped asking for a wife. <laughs> I said, you know, just forget the wife thing. <laughs> so I didn't ask for any more wives. But um, so I went home that evening after I heard this Jewish preacher say this on the radio. I went home. And I really wanted to understand myself, and I couldn't see what was holding me back. And I'm sitting there in my bedroom, just quietly with my eyes closed, not asking with words, but I just had a hunger for the truth. I wanted to, I had read in the Bible that children of God should be free, and we should have a good life, you know. And so I wanted to know what it's like to live as a son of God. What is that like? And so God allowed me to see that I resented my mother. And I had not been able to see that before. What happened was um, my mother got pregnant out of wedlock. And during those days, it was an embarrassment to get pregnant out of wedlock. And so when she told my father about it, he denied it. And he's like, no, that's not mine. I didn't do that, you know. And so my mother ended up marrying my stepfather just before I was born because it was an embarrassment to be pregnant out of wedlock. But she hated my father from that day forward. And so when I was growing up, I, even though I had a nice step, stepfather, I had to yearn and just hunger for my real dad. And I couldn't help it. God put it there. I wanted my father, but my mother tried to keep me away from him because of her resentment toward him. And, and so after a while, I resented my mother for that, not realizing that I resented her as a kid, but I resented her because I thought she was mean for keeping me away from my father. And whenever you become resentful, when you have anger, you become like what you hate. You take on the identity of the person that you hate. That spirit that's in them is transferred to you. And you start thinking and living and feeling like that person. Excuse me, I'm dealing with it. It's, uh, it's springtime in California right now. It's funny, I grew up in Alabama and I, and I was around birds and trees and bees and everything. I never had allergy problem. When I moved to LA, that's when I got it. And I knew then something was wrong with L.A. <laughs> I soon realized it was the Democrats. <laughs> 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 
So long story short here, I, I realized that I resented my mother because she tried to turn me away and I had become like her, insecure, you know, had doubt and fear and worry. And I read in the Bible that if you forgive others, God will forgive you. And so I, um, my mother came to L.A. Uh, and to visit her sister, and I was 38 at the time, and I knew I had to face my mother to forgive her. And I'm driving over to the house there so I can talk with her. And I'm 38 years old, and the closer I got to the house, fear would just overtake me. I could hardly breathe. By the time I got to the house, I realized, wow, why am I so afraid of my mother? I'm 38 years old. <laughs> But I remember as a kid, you know, whenever you try to speak up, she would tell you to be quiet, you're being disobedient. She didn't have, the pa didn't have the patience with me. And so I resented all that, not really understanding it. I got there, my mother having fun, talking to her sister, and I told her, and right away Satan said, this is the wrong time, you can't talk to her now, you're going to spoil her vacation. But I knew it was my moment, I knew it was my opportunity to forgive. I took her in the room and I told my mother what I just told you. And I said that I'm sorry for resenting you for that. I realized that you couldn't help yourself now. And but I be, because I become like you and I can't help myself. And if I can't help myself, I have to understand you couldn't help yourself. And I'm sorry for resenting you. And my mother for the first time told me about her life and exactly what she had done to me was done to her by her mother. And I thought my grandmother was an angel sent by God. But the same thing happened to her. And I, when I told my mother, I'm sorry for resenting you, in that moment, God forgave me. And when God forgave me, he took away all of my fears, all of my doubts, all of my worries, and my insecurities, and he gave me perfect peace. And that was 22 years ago, and I've gone through more hell in the last 22, 24 years than I had gone through then. But I still have that peace, because I realized that my battle now, I realize my battle is a spiritual battle between good and evil, right versus wrong. It's not a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. God said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and wickedness in high places. And there are people that evil is working through, and there are others where good is working through. And if you can see the spirit of what's going on, you can deal with the situation in a perfect manner. And God has blessed me to, uh, by allowing me to see that. Uh, I did go and deal, I dealt with my father as well, but I wasn't mad at my father. I was just disappointed that I could not be with him. And he explained to me what has hap had happened. And so my, my, mother, my mother died after that, uh, 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 you know, years after that. And I had been trying to tell my mother, I said, you know, Mom, you need to forgive my father. He was wrong, but he couldn't help himself. You guys were young. He couldn't help himself. She's like, no, I'm not going to forgive him. I said, well, you're hurting yourself. You don't want to die with this anger because you're not going to go where you think you're going if you die with an a unforgiven heart. And, and to my surprise, uh, my mother called my dad up one day and apologized for, what, for hating him. And three weeks later, she died of a heart attack in the bathroom. But she forgave my father just before she died. Isn't that nice that she didn't die with that kind of anger? <clears throat> and so I realized from all that that black Americans are suffering not because of racism, but the lack of moral character. They break up other family. What happened uh, uh, 50 years ago, the government came in under Linda B. Johnson, and it said to black Americans, we're going to take care of you, but you can't have a father in the home. You just have to be women and children. And for some reason, black Americans gave into that for the most part. And when the government took over, it became the daddy of the family. And these corrupt so-called black leaders became the head of the people, and it's just been downhill ever since. And I'd have to tell you, the worst thing that can happen to a child, whether male or female, black or white or whatever color, is to turn them away from their fathers. There is a spiritual order to life, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we can appreciate it or not. And that order is God and Christ, Christ and man, man over woman, and the woman over children, the woman over the children. It's a spiritual order. It's not a contest. It's a spiritual order. When you have that order in the home, you have a better chance for a good life. But when you remove that father, you remove Christ out of the homes. 
and the kids spend a lifetime trying to understand what's wrong. And the government, because it's evil, it understands that. That's why it goes after the fathers first. Get rid of that father, and the women and children will rely on the government to take care of them. And the government is anti-God, anti-family, anti-country, anti-good. And so that's why it goes after the father. Men represent Christ on earth. They just don't know it. And so uh, when they took that man out, because when I was growing up, I had my stepfather, my mother, I had my grandfather and my mother. And so we had good examples. I was taught to work. When I would get out of school in the, in the evenings, I would have to pick cotton, you know, take off my school clothes, go to the cotton field, plant, you know, plant, bring in the harvest, just all kind of stuff. But it made me, it gave me the ability to work. And then I had good examples around me that was doing that. And when I was growing up, I did not know you could rely on the government. We had never heard of the government because it was family, uh, it was our, uh, you know, folks down the road and the church. When we needed help, the people jumped in and we helped one another. But black Americans are now relying on the government and their false leaders. When I was growing up, less than 10% of black children were born out of wetlock because we had that family order and it was an embarrassment to have children out of wetlock. Today, nationwide, according to the Census Bureau, 70% of black children are born out of wetlock. Seven zero. And in the state of Indiana, uh, Virginia, and other states around, 80% of black babies are born out of wetlock today. That would not have happened had the family stayed together and not relied on the government. Um, abortion, out of control. Everybody and their mama having abortions today in the black community. 70% um, of Planned Parenthood abortion meals are located in the inner cities. Uh, every day, every day, 1,500 black babies are aborted. Every day. And we cannot get the black preachers or the, uh, or the black churches to get involved. And the reason they won't get involved because Planned Parenthood and the government is pouring money into these churches and into these organizations. And so these people love money over salvation. And a lot of the black preachers are racist. They don't care about what is right anymore. They are helping to keep black Americans down because you cannot control a moral people. You have to demoralize them in order to control them. And that's what has happened over the last 50 years. And for that reason, I started the organization BOND, the Brotherhood Organization of a New Destiny. And our purpose is to rebuild the family by rebuilding the man. I believe if we can get men to turn back to God and love him with all their heart, soul, and might, get married, and, husband, and, and the wife loves her husband who loved God, and the children will see that, I believe we can change America overnight when you restore that family. Because it's not about race, it's about good versus evil. We have a home for young men that we bring in from around the country, we show these guys how to overcome anger, finish school, start businesses, get jobs. Uh, some of them go off to colleges around the country and others start businesses. And I'm proud to tell you that we've done this for 22 years. We just had our 22nd anniversary this past fr uh, February. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I am proud to tell you that we have not asked for one penny from the government, nor have we received one penny from the government. Not less government, better off you are. It really is. And we want to show them that this is the greatest country in the world. Everybody and their mama are trying to come here. And when you rely on the government, or you're unable to work, or unwilling to work, and you're unwilling to treat people the way you would like to be treated, you're not gonna make it in this country. But if you love what's right, you do the right thing, you can make it. One quick example, we have so many stories, I brought some newsletters for you. There was a young man who came to us at the age of 15. He was angry at his parents, they couldn't do anything with him. We got them together, showed them how to forgive, helped the young man overcome his anger. He felt good about himself, he went on and finished high school with high honors. From there, he went to Princeton and graduated from Princeton. And then from there, he went to uh, Stanford Law School. And he graduated from Stanford. And then he went to Washington, D.C. and worked for a major law firm in Washington, D.C. This past fall, he is now working for a judge up in uh, Washington State. 
And hopefully, uh, 2003, he's trying to work for Justice Clarence Thomas at the Supreme Court. And he wants to eventually become a, Supreme, a U.S. Supreme Court justice. And that just shows to show you when they feel good about themselves and they see how to work, they can make it in America. And here's just one story that we have for you. <clears throat> I have, been, I have been called, oh, let me tell you this. When God forgave me as I forgave my parents, I became, uh, you know, free. I have perfect peace. And, and so I had one more request for God. And so I said to him, you know what? I have one more favor, God. He's like, well, what is it? I said, you have taken away my anger. You've given me uh, uh, perfect peace. I said, I can know I'm a Democrat, and I can no longer uh, identify with the Democratic platform. Can you forgive me for being a Democrat? <laughs> and God said yes, and he forgave me, and I became a conservative Republican all the way, conservative through and through. <clears throat> now, I realize that all conservatives are not living up to the platform. All right, I, I see that. But I believe in the platform of the conservative party. God, country, constitution, freedom. I believe in that, right? So I do realize we have some pretty weak leaders right now in, in, the, in the government. But I, I, it's still worth fighting for. Those values are worth fighting for. That's why I started the uh, South Central LAT party, and to, to educate and to inform the folks about it. But when I told my family, when my family members discovered that I was a Republican, <laughs> conservative, they thought I had lost my mind. Absolutely lost it, right? They cannot, but they're like, what happened to you? How did you become that way? And then when they see me on TV or they hear me on different radio shows, it just, it, it's, it's crazy. I wish you could come to some of my family meals when we have family gathering. It's a war. But I have a whole lot of fun. All I have to do is just say something, and they all go wild. <laughs> and so I just sit back and look at them going crazy like I'm looking at a movie. <laughs> and you can have like 20 of them against one person, and they go insane. And I realize it's because they're angry, their values are in the wrong place, and when you're angry, you hate truth. Angry people do not love to hear the truth. Anybody ever been married before? <laughs> or dated in your life? I used to date a lot, right? And I noticed that whenever my, my girlfriend would want to control me, she would lie to me. She would say to me, you know what? If she, let's say that she wanted to buy something and she wanted some money from me. And she would lie to me. She would say, you know what? I love you. <laughs> She would say, you're so wonderful, you're so handsome. <laughs> my mother loves you too, right? And she's working on my ego like that to get what she wants because the ego loves lies. And, 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 and the bigger the lie is, the better it is for the ego. That's why we ended up with Bill Clinton twice. <laughs> I'm hoping it doesn't happen with Bar uh, Obama twice because he's the worst liar than Bill Clinton was. But anyway, she would get me all feeling good, ego all pumped up, off lies. And then she would say, oh, can you let me have some money to go to the store and buy something? I'm like, no, I can't let you have any money. And then she'd get mad. You're no good. <laughs> you're cheap. <laughs> and you're not that handsome. My, <laughs> my mother told me not to deal with you. And now I'm angry. And the moment I become angry because the ego is hurting now, it's been insulted, right? And when I become angry, I become guilty, and then I have to give her the money so she can feel better and I feel better. <laughs> the men know what I'm talking about, right? Right, guys? They're afraid to say yes. <laughs> I understand, guys. I used to be afraid of women, too. <laughs> but when I forgave my mother, God took away that from me, and I'm not afraid to tell women the truth. I love them enough to be honest with them as well. But I say all that to say to you that we got to lay down the ego. You got to lay that down so that you can see the right thing to do. 
not how you feel, not what you think, but what is right. You got to learn to stand on what is right. And when, when the, the liberals found out, black liberals especially, when they found out that I was a conservative Republican, they went after me and they're still doing it. I've been called every name in the book and then some. Uncle Tom, sell out. You hate your mama, you hate your daddy. I've been banned from three radio stations because they threatened to blow up the radio tiles. Uh, I have been called, <laughs> I, I, I have been called names that I never, ever heard of. I've been called nigger so much. You ever heard the word nigger? <laughs> White people are afraid of that word, huh? Don't say nigger. <laughs> and black people are like, nigger, please. Let me say, tell you about that word. Black people do not care about that word at all. It's just another way of controlling white folks. That's all that is about. Because if they cared about the word nigger, they would stop using it first. And then the word would fade away. That's how you know who you care. They don't care about that. It's another way of controlling you. But I've been called nigger so much that I was thinking about changing my middle name. <laughs> Uh, oh God. It's funny, I've heard I've said that so many times, and every time I say it, it's still funny. But I told my staff one day, I said, you know what? I think I just changed my middle name from Jesse Lee Peterson to Jesse Nigger Peterson. <laughs> because what they don't know is that I love what's right with all my heart, all my soul, and all my might. I, I have five adopted children that I have. I adopted as a result of the organization, four girls and a boy. And I love my kids, but I love what's right more than I love them. I love what's right more than I love my country. I love what's right more than anything else because that's what set me free. That's, that's God's love guiding me. And there is nothing on earth that I would give it up for. And God, once he took away my anger, he set me on my way. I do what I do because I can see clearly to do it. I didn't plan to do it, right? And that's what happens when you give up your anger, then your purpose in life become clear to you. But when you have anger, you're living in the darkness of your imagination and you can't see what's, what God had created for you to do in life. And so what they don't know, they could call me whatever they want. I love what's right. I love my country. I love the family. And I, and I appreciate the Constitution and this great nation, and I refuse to cower down to name calling. Call me whatever they want, because I realize that liberals do not have a foundation to stand on. They only have intimidation. And if you don't give in to the intimidation, they have nothing. And that's why I want to say to white America in closing here, that you got to get over the fear of being called a racist. You got to let that go. Let them call you whatever they want. Because just imagine, just think for a moment, if you didn't care about being called a racist, what else would they have? They have nothing else. They don't have God on their side. And if you are of God, you have good on your side. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So you have good if you don't give it to Satan's children who only have intimidation. So let it roll off your back. If they call your name, just look at them with merry eyes twinkling and they will fade away. They'll go nuts. All right? Don't give in to that intimidation. And my last warning to you is that God has given us one more chance to save this great nation. And that chance is coming in November. Obama, I tried to warn you not to vote for him, that he's a liar when he lied about his relationship with Jeremiah Wright Jr., sat there for 20 years, gave this guy money, said that he's like an uncle to him, married, he had beat Mama Michelle. <laughs> and I'm gonna make this short because I know my time is up by now. I call Big Mama, I call her Big Mama because she's trying to uh, force laws on us to eat what we want, uh, what she wants us to eat, right? and feed our children what, what she wants us to have, what she wants them to have, while at the same time she's going around the country peeking out on ribs and hamburgers. <laughs> 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 so I call her Big Mama. 
because you want to take care of us. But uh, Obama is a, a, a lion, redistribution of wealth, black liberation theology, white hating, Jewish hating, American value hating, freedom hating kind of a guy. And, and if Barack Obama is given another four years, goodbye America. Because he doesn't care what white folks think. Not at all. He doesn't care what the folks in Israel think. Obama, Jeremiah Wright Jr., Louis Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, the, the New Black Panther Party, the NAACP, Al Sharpton, and, and most other black preachers, they have the same mindset. And that mindset is white, America's, white America is the enemy of black America, and we're going to divide the race so that we can conquer. And Obama would do that. He would turn America into a socialist society if he's given another three years, another four years. So if you don't like Mitt Romney or whomever going to run against him, I will swallow it up this time, choke it up, and let's get Barack Obama out of there. And then if whomever we vote in don't do the right thing, we have a chance for another four years and vote them out and put in someone that's going to do the right thing when they see that we're serious. All right? And so, don't let Satan mess with your mind. Oh, he's a Mormon, he's this, he, he's better than Barack Obama. Obama is wicked to the core. Eric Holder, the Attorney General, wicked to the core. They're all racist. I used to go to those meetings when I was a Democrat. I know what they're thinking. And they don't like you. They don't like you, they don't like Mer America as it is. And they will destroy it. They're all in the same bed together. Take my word on that. And Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich, and whomever else run, are, they are not worse than Barack Obama. And what we're going to have to go through if you don't think straight in this situation. I want to encourage you to be brave and be bold. Don't be afraid. Blacks and whites and others, those who are children of God, have to come together as children of God. Not as black and white, but as what is right. We got to come together. This is the greatest country. When I see Warren Duffy, I'm telling you, I used to see things in a black and white kind of thing. But when I see Warren, I see his spirit. I see, yes, he's light skinned, but his heart is what I see. I see my brother. I don't see some white man that I have to hate and be afraid of. I see that we won. We are one because we serve the same God. And you got to start realizing that. All right? Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. It is a spiritual battle, and to the white men, you have a responsibility given to you by God to protect your wife and children spiritually and financially. And they're trying to separate you from your family by calling you a racist and, and hate women and hate men, because if they can do what they've done to black America, the black family, destroy God's order, they can take your, your wife and children and do exactly what they want to do. So white men, you have a responsibility to stand up and protect your family. I want you, let them call your names, but don't turn your family over to them. All right? Thank you for having me here. Greater is he, is he, he that's in us than he that's in the world. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.